Um, thank you very much for being here. I'm delighted to uh, be in Sao Paulo and uh, very uh, happy to be here at the CELO conference. Um, I have a fairly long presentation. Uh, I will try and keep within the 15 minutes, but uh, I will cut it off uh, uh, when I run out of time. Uh, but I believe that the slides are going to be made available. Um, it, oh, I've got 30. It said 15 there. Good. I've got about 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. It, it said 15 on the sheet, so good. Great. Okay. So, um, I've been a, a professor for a number of years, so I've learned very early on to start up front with the key ideas that I want to, to get across. And um, if, we, if we want to develop a sensible approach to measuring the results of science investments, what we should be thinking about is what's the right theoretical framework and what's the right empirical framework, and not just to think about it in a narrow national sense, but very much in an international sense. And so what I'm going to argue is a sensible uh, conceptual framework as one that has a theoretically, theoretical driver, that uses the right units of analysis, and that is generalizable and replicable, because generalizable, generalizability and replicability are the core notions of science. Uh, and then for an empirical framework, I think we should recognize that we're in the 21st century and we should use 21st century tools. And the reason for wanting an international activity is of course that science is international. It is not closed within national boundaries. So, so that's kind of the ideas and the themes that I'm going to develop. So I'm going to give you the motivation and then walk you through both the conceptual and empirical framework. So having just told you the international framework, I'm going to start with very much an American motivation, except that this American motivation has been replicated in every country that I have visited uh, over the past uh, five or six years. Uh, every country, the motivation is the taxpayer is spending money on science and research. What are the returns? What is the evidence? We can't continue to tell stories that you put money in and then a miracle occurs. We, we have to provide something that is substantive. And it is important to get that right because as we all know, what we measure is what we get. That's a basic principle of management. So if you measure uh, widgets, you get widgets. If you measure documents, you get documents. Really important to think through what we're measuring. And uh, I always refer back to Jack Marburger's um, science editorial which was the driving force in many ways to the establishment of a science, of science policy. And he asked the basic questions here. How much should a country spend on science? I came yesterday from Istanbul. I was at an OECD conference on the knowledge-driven society. As you know, the European Union is saying we need to spend 3% of GDP on research and development. Well, why 3%? Why not 2.9? Why not 3.1? That's a very big difference in terms of how much money we spend on these key activities. We have to be able to answer that question. Um, and then what kind of science? Should it be nanotech or biotech? Should it be uh, 
physical sciences or political sciences? Uh, how much should we expect to come from the public sector? How much from the private sector? And very much that depends on what we think the returns are, how much they're social and how much they're private. And right now, we're looking at cutbacks in many countries, and the scientific community is protesting. Is that because there is not enough funding, or is it that there are too many performers who need funding? Is it a shortage of funding, or a surfeit of performers? So, in summary, we spend a lot of money on science, and it's reasonable for the taxpayer to want to know what is the impact. And my favorite cartoon is down the bottom. That's a little picture of uh, scientists at a blackboard. And on the left-hand side, there is, uh, they're drawing a picture of, uh, with equations. And on the right-hand side, there's another set of equations. And in the middle, they say, then a miracle occurs. And what the scientist says to the other scientist, I think we need to be a little bit more explicit in step two. And it's a little bit like we do in science. We say, put money in, and then 20 years later, we're going to get the internet. We're going to get Google. Magic's going to happen in between, and how can we possibly explain how that magic happens? Well, what I'm going to argue today is we need to unpack that step two. Okay? So how do you unpack that? How do you measure the impact? Well, it turns out that obviously there are many, many statisticians and scientists who've thought about measuring impact in other contexts other than science and innovation and in similarly complex environments. So, for example, in education, you want to understand the impact of early childhood interventions for children under five on their subsequent success 20 years later. You have many complex activities that, that interact, the family, the household, the village, the, the environment, and you have many complex outcomes. How do you think through what the impact of a particular set of investments or interventions are? You have the same thing in international development. Do you give kids textbooks or workbooks? Do you deworm them? Do you have better teachers? And how do you tease out? So the classic examples that we ask in science are the same kinds of things that have been asked in other areas of social activity. What is the impact or causal effect? Now that causal effect is very important. Not just descriptions, but can we walk through a theory of change? Is a given program effective compared to the absence of the program? Does it matter if we fund individuals? or teams of individuals, or entire research fields? Does it matter if we give two-year grants or five-year grants? So how, how is funding structured? And when a program can be implemented in several ways, which one is the most effective? These are core questions. And that's, in essence, no different from thinking about Pasteur's swan flask. You've got a set of initial conditions, you've got an intervention, and you want to compare the result of an intervention relative to a counterfactual, a carefully constructed counterfactual, in order to understand the impact. What would have happened, and apologize to the translators for the subjunctive, but what would have happened had the intervention not in occurred? Okay, so, so that's classic science. It's no different in a social science than in a physical science. So now how are we going to think about that? Well, just like any science, 
you want to think of what is your theory of change. Now this happens to be a linear process because it's easier to explain uh, in, a, in a picture uh, when I'm giving a talk. Obviously it's quite non-linear in many situations, but I'm just going to go through a linear example here. Let's write down what we think the inputs are. What activities are being affected by those inputs? So let's write that down. Then what do we expect those activities to generate in the short term and longer term? And what do we expect the fundamental outcomes to be? So what we're really talking about here is those middle three boxes are trying to unpack the miracle occurs bit, right? It's not just saying inputs 20 years later, magic happens. How do we unpack that and how do we write it down? So what I'm going to argue is we need a theory of change. We need to have something that uses the appropriate unit of analysis. And if you think about what the right unit of analysis is, it, is, it doesn't make sense to talk about the unit of analysis as being the funding activity itself, because the funding activity is the intervention. The activity that you're trying to change is the behavior of people of scientists. It is scientists who do science, not documents. So the right unit of analysis is human beings, scientists, graduate students, post I include postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, undergraduate students, staff scientists, as well as faculty. It's a complex group of individuals that make up a team, and the right unit is the, 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 the people who are engaged in doing the science. The grant or the research funding is the intervention that affects the behavior of the people. And clearly, and I don't need to tell this group this, in order for it to be true science, the data have to be open because any analysis that is done has to be able to be generalized and replicated, and that cannot be done if the data are proprietary. Okay. So this is the theory of change that I would argue makes sense. If you think about the way in which funding works, the dollars, what that affects is the behavior of people, the way in which they uh, collaborate on projects, which is the most granular unit of analysis, the way that they co-author, the way in which they train students. It's the scientific research networks as well as the collaboration of the scientific sector with the private sector that is the fundamental activity of interest. That's the, that's the black box we're interested in. Of course, the funding goes to institutions as well. You have to incorporate information about the institutional framework, the equipment, the materials, the access to common core resources that go into the production of science. And it is those factors that then enable us to produce scientific economic and workforce products. Now you'll notice how different this picture is from many pictures that you see. What many pictures that you see go directly from funding to products. And they try and create an arbitrary link between the um, funding activity and try to bucket the ideas associated with that funding activity and tie them tightly together. 
And I argue that is completely the wrong framework within which to operate for many reasons. If you think about how science is done, it is done by scientific networks and by the free creation, transmission, and adoption of ideas. And that happens over multiple generations of scientists, and it happens through people who then, over time, generate a wide variety of scientific and economic and workforce products. The notion that science is a slot machine where you put money in and three years later out pops a paper or a patent doesn't describe science at all. So that's why that conceptual framework deliberately leaves out that, that specific tie. In other words, if you want to look at the activities that the funding is going to affect, the activities are the people. Okay? So, just, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time in this, on this slide, but if you wanted to write that down in an equation that can be estimated, you would say, uh, essentially what funding, which is Z, is doing is affecting the creation or the sustenance or the persistence of scientific networks thinking about a particular area. Beta is the efficiency with which that funding creates and sustains high quality networks. X is other factors. Then, so that's equation two. Then in turn, it's those networks that create the ideas that we're interested in. Uh, the y variable in y sub one in, uh, in equation one. And of course there are other factors that you're interested in. So now the question is going to be, how do we capture information on people? How do we capture the interrelationships of people in their scientific activity? And then what are the right left-hand side variables that we might be interested in. Recognizing that this is, I've written this down very simply, there's a lot of endogeneity and, and other things that you need to worry about, but again, this is a overarching presentation, not a detailed uh, analysis. So my colleague Jason Owen Smith has drawn an, a, an even prettier picture. This is his description of how science investments work. That is a picture of Congress on the left-hand side. This is a Congress that magically happens to be open. Uh, and it sends money to a university, and that funds individual ideas, networks of people, and then it's those people that generate intermediate outputs, and then the kind of outcomes that we're interested in. And you can, my point here is once you've got that framework, then you can start thinking about how to measure it. So how are we going to measure it? I'm going to talk very much about what we've been developing uh, both in the US and in other countries, which is the star metrics approach. So the first thing is, is how do you capture information on the scientific workforce at the project level? That's that's the level at which science investments, research investments directly affect. And then level two is how do we, have, how do we capture information about those individuals and their uh, subsequent activities. So the core notion here is we should recognize that we're in the 21st century and that those data do not have to be collected manually, that they can be generated automatically because they sit within the administrative data systems of each research organization that receives funds. And I'm not going to walk through this in any detail, but the notion here is every time people are supported on a grant, or purchases are made 
of vendors of scientific equipment or of the services that are necessary for the production of science, all of that is captured because a payment is made by the research organization either to the people or to the equipment producer. So the que what we did with Star Metrics is harness that digital information and capture it in an automated way so that you can generate flow information on who's doing work in what area for all participating institutions. And that enables you to get a much better sense of the production of science. I'm going to give you a couple of concrete examples in just a minute. And this is my colleague Bruce Weinberg's slide. Um, what you then want to do is capture the information on what those people do by tying into things like silo, uh, by linking those people with their scientific economic activities, and not just thinking about publications and patents, but also thinking about the students that are produced and the work and where those students go. Uh, and that's going to enable you to, to get a, a much better sense of what's going on. So in other words, what Star Metrics starts off with is capturing information about people and then captures information about the funding that they have received, the institutional expenditures from vendors, and then ties it to their scientific and economic and workforce outcomes. And again, I'm going to give you a very specific example in just a minute. And do that in an automated way, not rely on manual reporting. So uh, those are the key ideas for the empirical framework. Um, use a variety of 21st century technologies to capture that information. Almost don't all scientific and economic activity forms. occurs You don't need to. It's all, as much as possible, should be out there and available. And then use 21st century activities to link the, what people are doing. Uh, Cody Borner, who's in the audience, pointed out, was the first person to point out to me uh, what the Brazilian latte system has built that has now been emulated in many countries, including the United States, based on a visit that uh, we made to Brasilia uh, a few years ago to CMPQ that helped inform the development of the CYAN-CV system. Uh, and so having automated CV systems, having uh, disambiguation algorithms, uh, as well as things like ORCID are very important in this. I'm going to give you a practical example. Uh, so the Star Metrics program uh, has about over 100 universities participating. Um, that's about 45% of uh, NSF and NIH funding in the United States, so it's a lot of the big universities. And so what, what a number of researchers, not just me, are starting to do, as well as in collaboration with the universities, is starting to look at that data and see what we can understand. So um, here's an example that's funded by the Sloan Foundation. Uh, and my colleagues are Jacques Marais uh, from uh, ENSE in France and Paula Stefan from the National Bureau of Economic Research. And the notion here was, what can we do to automate an um, analytical framework like the one I have described at a high level so that it can be replicated across other star metrics institutions. And Caltech is one of the most famous institutions in the country. I'm going to show you what we did for Caltech. I'm going to show you how we're replicating that approach with other star metrics institutions, and then I'm going to shut up. Okay? So, because you have data on all researchers at Caltech for going back 12 years, you've got a sense of 
how much money they are receiving. You can automatically pull information on each project on who they are working with and their occupational characteristics. So if you think of one core unit of analysis in the production of scientific ideas, remember we're interested in the creation, transmission, and adoption of ideas, the scientific lab is one of those. The, the principal investigator, if you think about it, is like the, the chief executive officer of a firm. They need to figure out how many graduate students, staff scientists, and undergraduate students and postdoctoral fellows to hire, what kind of equipment to purchase, and how to put that together to produce and sell ideas. And when we talked to the Caltech principal investigators, it was clear they thought of themselves as the firm. So you can capture the lab staffing. From the financial data, you can see what, not just what the workforce was in the production of science, but also their purchases of equipment. The nature of science is very different depending on whether you buy a genome sequencing machine or, a, or um, a large telescope. And the, that also changes your workforce composition. You could then tie that to what they produced. And this is a very crude measure. We're obviously enhancing our output measures. You could see how many PhDs they've supervised. You could see how many patents they've generated and who they've collaborated with. And then you can start putting that information into the kind of analytical framework that I wrote down. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. You can cap all of this information is captured without asking a principal investigator to lift a pen. And the, where we're heading is to capture that information and also tie it to the placement of their students, the nature of their, qual their publications and so on, what their ideas are and how they're getting transmitted. Um, but that's just the most granular level of activity, which is looking at the individual lab. Because you've got data on the most detailed level, you can then expand that up to look at individual, go beyond individual labs to scientific fields, to organizations, to sub-disciplines and so on, depending on the level of aggregation that you want to analyze. So I'm almost out of time, but that Caltech study is now getting expanded to include the CIC institutions, the Committee on Institutional Cooperation Schools. They account for about 10% of uh, NSF and NIH funding. And what one question that you might want to look at is what's the impact of different funding structures on the training of students? So now your Y variable becomes not publications and patents and the production of students, but what happens to the students, the career outcomes of the students. Does it matter whether the student is working one-on-one -on -one with a principal investigator, or does it matter whether they're working in a big interdisciplinary center? And so what we're doing is we're building off the Caltech data infrastructure expanding it to the CIC institutions, and then you start looking at the impact of different funding structures on the outcomes of the individual students of interest. Does that make sense? Um, and and I, I'm running out of time, but how do you create a sensible counterfactual? It turns out that you want to introduce some exogenous shocks, like the uh, swan flask example, 
uh, you have a contaminant that is entered into the system and you construct an appropriate counterfactual. So we have an exogenous shock, which was stimulus funding uh, for the Recovery Act that came in and sharply changed the amount of money that was available. And we can trace through the impact of a before and after uh, on, the, on the outcomes of the students. I said that we were interested in doing international comparisons, uh, that this is an international activity. There are a number of other universities and countries that are moving in the same direction. Uh, and so there is a collaborative network that is building to get common ideas on what the output measure should be, the structure of the teams, and, uh, and the appropriate types of analyses that make sense. So, to conclude, I said we spend a lot of money on, on research. What's the impact? What we're interested in doing is unpacking that magic little black box. And so the key ideas I wanted to introduce, which is what I started with, is we, we need to have a scientific framework. The theory of change I put out as a hypothesis we should be debating what works and the approaches that work. I'm not telling you it's the truth. I'm saying this is a way of thinking about it. Uh, we should, as a community, and this is very much what this conference is about, build a data infrastructure that enables us to test different types of hypotheses uh, that enable us to unpack that black box and build an international community of scientists that are studying these issues. And as I understand it, that is exactly the kind of thing that this conference is about. Thank you very much indeed, and I hope I kept to my time.